All right, Safra, are you there? Yeah. All right. Are we ready? Yeah. We're ready to start. Yeah. yeah. Father Esmeron, are you with us? I am here, yeah. All righty. We are, well, uh, welcome everyone. And uh, we're happy to have you with our monthly a webinar for OCCM. Uh, this month yeah. is, uh, as every time, as every month, it's, it's a special month because we have a special topic and a special guest speaker who has uh, a special story to tell or special influence with the talk that they will give us. So we're happy to have with us uh, Father Asmaron uh, from Atlanta, from the Arabian Orthodox uh, Church. And uh, he is going to talk to, to us today about the sanctity of life, the topic of abortion, which we know there's a lot of controversy about, and uh, especially on university campus. Um, we hear a lot about it, whether through academics or through uh, sort of events on campus and uh, groups. So we're happy to have with us Father Esmeron, who will, be, who will speak to us from the, uh, truly from the lens of the church, which is the, the, the title of our webinar series. He will teach us from the lens of the church today, um, our, the church's perspective, and share with us uh, some of his uh, wisdom and insight into this topic. Um, Safra, I'll uh, open the, turn it okay. over to you. Um, actually, Father Asmaram, can you uh, start us off in prayer real quick? Okay, okay, thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will grant us the will to do good, the, to flee from evil, and to practice all righteousness, making us respectful of life, and sharers of your blessings, caring for one another in mercy and truth. We also pray that you will banish all evil from our hearts and the weakness from our laws, enabling us to be servants of your holy will and performance of your love. May it as well be pray thankfully, our Father who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those so trespass against us and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from all evil. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Father. Hello, everyone. As Abuna Jarab said, welcome to our third webinar of the series from the lens of the church. As always, before we start, we are going to go over some ground rules. Uh, here we go. Efra, would you okay. be able to make me to share my PowerPoint as yes. your co-host or something? Yes, we will. Um, so some rules for the webinar. One, keep your video on. Um, this is because we want this to be as interactive as possible. Make sure that y'all are paying attention. Two, keep yourself muted. This is to respect the speaker and their time. Uh, we ask that you rename yourself to your first and last name and then the abbreviation for your school so we can see where everyone is from. Uh, if you have any questions, please send it to Lydia Mansour. Ab Henry is not with us. 
um, father. Okay. And then, um, and then lastly, uh, take this back to all of your, um, all of your campus groups and your youth groups. Um, this only works if we uh, actually use this knowledge um, back home. So to quickly introduce our speaker, uh, Father Asmaram Hagos currently serves as a priest of the Eritrean Orthodox Church in Georgia. In 2004, he completed his PhD in chemistry with a focus in medicinal chemistry and pharmaceuticals. He obtained a PharmD in 2010 from Mercer University, and he currently works as a clinical pharmacist at St. Joseph Hospital at Emory University. So for all of our watchers and participants who are interested in um, pharmacy, uh, this is a really good point of contact. And with that being said, Father Asmaram, it is all yours. Um, okay. Right now, right now we see the presenter view though. Okay. Is there a way for you to switch? Yeah, I will change it. Let me see. Will you able to see me now? Can you see me? Yes, we can. Can you also um, change your uh, slide view so that it's full screen? Oh, the slide the view is, it is only slide view. Is it not showing? If you go up to the top, do you see where it says display settings? Oh, this place. Oh, okay. And then switch. Yeah, once you and then swap. Yeah, swap. click the oh, first okay. one. Uh -huh. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. The other one doesn't doesn't let you see because I have my notes also on my PowerPoint. It doesn't show me. So do you want me to share the presentation so you can see the notes on your computer? It is, it is a different, uh, slightly different, but I, I can go ahead. Okay. Yeah, you can share also. I guess you can share and then we'll, we'll continue from there because my notes are also over there. Okay. I will share my screen. So do you want me to stop the sharing? Uh, yes, please. Perfect. Can you all see it? Okay. Go ahead, Father. So uh, thank you, first of all, for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk uh, tonight with you and to share the word of God. I am glad I'm here and hopefully all of us will get something uh, tonight. Thank you, Safara, and also Father Jerome for introducing me. Yeah, my name is Father Asmorom Hagos. I'm from Merhan Allen Eritrean Orthodox Church, Atlanta, Georgia, specifically on uh, Lithonia. And we are about to start the sanctity of uh, life. And this is an important topic. And we'll be looking at it, uh, what the sanctity of life it is. And what is God's plan for each one of us and how we see a child, whether it is born or unborn. And the various uh, assumptions that uh, people and then based on that what they do and then what we can learn from that and also share with others 
our experiences and our knowledge so that we'll have to make a better decision. So I will start with the sanctity of life. And human life is sacred, holy, and precious. Meaning when we say sacred, it is something worthy of reverence and respect. It is highly valued and it is also important to us or to God. It is something irreplaceable, something that you cannot replace it once it is gone. And then it is something that you don't want to miss because it is uh, irreplaceable. As a result of that, therefore, it must be protected. Life must be protected at any uh, cost. And as we know, when God created all things at the end, this is what he said, God saw all that had made and it was beautiful or it was very good. So what God created was beautiful and then he gave it also to man to rule over it. So we'll see how precious it is. So when we say it is a precious, it is something that we cannot mess up with. The reason is simply life, we didn't start it. We have nothing to do to start life. It originated from the very God that we know, that we love, and he always loves us. And it starts on Genesis, as we all know. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they will rule over everything that he has created. So God created man in his own image. But that is not the only thing he did. It is one thing to have the image of God. It is one thing to have the likeness of God. But it is a different thing when, in fact, it is so special that he imparted part of himself. And it says, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed it into his nostrils. And that breath is the breath of life. As a result of that, and then the man became a living being. So in order for us to be a living being, to look like God, to, to be the image of God, he didn't just made us and then we look like him, but he also he imparted us his very thing that he is life and he imparted his life with us. That's why we are so special or life is so special because it originates from the very God. And it is a holy one because we always say, Holy God the Father, Holy God the Son, Holy God the Holy Spirit. So it is holy and he imparted his holiness to his heart and we also say it is holy. And the other thing that he imparted is, he is God, he is the maker of all things. He is the Lord all over. And then he also gave us in order to rule on the earth that he's created himself. So not only he imparted has his image, his breath of life, but he imparted his power also to rule on everything that he gave us on us. So that's why uh, we are uh, precious in front of God. Now, this is in general about human being. How about each and the individual of us? And this one, God has a plan for every one of us. And I will give you a couple of examples from the Bible. 
And one of them was about the prophet Jeremiah. And this is what he told him. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So how God, he knew him before he even came to earth, he knew him. And before you were born, I consecrated it. I appointed you to be a prophet. And everything that God planned for Jeremiah was this. Before even he was born. To, rule, uh, to share with all the, uh, the nations. So he actually, he is speaking to Jeremiah, but God also knows each and individual of us the same way he knows Jeremiah or the same way he knows King David. He is a prophet on his own right because he has so many prophecies on Psalms of uh, King David also. And this is what uh, King David said. For my flesh was made by you and my parts joined together in my mother's body. My frame was not unseen by you when I was made secretly and strangely formed in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw me, my unformed substance, unformed substance, in your book, all my days were recorded, even those which were purposed before they had come into being. So you see how very detailed, how very specific, how detailed knows each and every one of us. So as a result of that, God has a plan for every human being that is about to present in, the, in this earth. And that's why uh, Jesus one time he said, uh, he was talking about not to be afraid about other things because God cares for them. And this is what he told. Birds that can be bought and sold by a couple of pennies, the Heavenly Father cares about them. And if he cares about them, how precious are you not for God? He knows everything about you. He cares about you, even to a point of a single hair doesn't fall without him knowing. Even though we have a lot of hair in our bathroom somewhere, we find them, we don't even know when the, it happened. But God knows when one hair falls from us. And isn't it beautiful that he knows us this much and he cares about us this much. And that's how much precious God is each and every one of us. So, now we are going to talk about the personhood of the unborn. So, the personhood of the unborn, again, I will give you a couple of examples in every topic so that you will be able to have a background to follow it. And this is on the feast of the conception of the John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist. So this is what happened. Zachariah is a priest and he is serving inside a church. And then an archangel Gabriel came to him. Your prayer has come to the ears of God. Your wife Elizabeth will have a son. Now, a son is a generic thing. There are many sons, right? But when he told him, he was very specific and his name is John. So you see, he knows what is coming and he calls each one of us by the name and he says, his name will be John. And this John is, we know it is so special, and so humble and a willful, uh, willful servant of God. This is the one who says, I am not the light, he is the light. I am just a witness of the light. He is the word. I am just his voice. He is the bridegroom. I am just a friend of the bridegroom. So this one that is chosen by God and God knew his name. 
And this is what Saint Gabriel said. I have been sent to say these words to you and to give you this good news. Once he gave this good news, Elizabeth also, she was so happy about it. She had been barren and she was, at that time, it is kind of shameful. That, that's how they were uh, taking it. When you have not a child and she is getting old, most of them are old to have a child even. So this news is really a cold water when you are in a desert. It's something that is satisfying so much that she had to hide it from men for five months. But it's not going to be hidden. Now there is someone who knows about this. And this is what she said when, when she got this good news. The Lord has done this to me, for his eyes were on me to take away my shame in the eyes of men. You see, it was considered shame that you don't have a child. And they are already old to have a child. And then this is how she was thankful. She hid for five months. Now, but it cannot be hidden because Saint Gabriel also had a new six months, almost around six months from that, another news to uh, our uh, Saint Mary. And he told her this, that she will have a boy. And Elizabeth is already pregnant five months. So she has to run to see if it is true and also to celebrate. And when she went, they hug each other. And this is what is happening. The moment Elizabeth saw this unborn baby, John, the baby made a sudden move inside her. The unborn John made a sudden move. Out. And then Saint Elizabeth, this is what she said. May blessing be on you among women a blessing also on the child of your body. For truly, when the sound of your voice came to my ears, the baby in my body made a sudden move. For what? For joy. The unborn boy is giving praise to the one that is to come, to the one that is the king, to the one that is savior, while he was inside. So this unborn, uh, what uh, different names we give, is in fact a full-fledged human being in front of God. In fact, he is a chosen one in this case. Remember five months. Now, let's also see the Annunciation of Our Lady, the Theotokos. So, here also the same good news was given by Archangel Saint Gabriel. Rejoice highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Again, she was afraid. Do not be afraid. Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son again, a generic name, a son. And then he continues with specificity, saying that ye shall call his name Jesus. So he just doesn't give us a son, but with a specific purpose. So we have two of them. Now let's even go more in detail to whose body is it? So we know that the source of life is God, but other people are also involved in it. Obviously, the mother and the father. But these are participants. The subject matter, the main one is the baby. The joining of the two that was the baby. And in certain amounts, the doctor uh, will also play part, but we have to answer 
whose body is it? Especially for us believers, the concept about uh, body has to be more than that. So whose body is it? And it starts with the mother and the father. Let's see with the mother and the father, all, all believers for that kid. And this is God sees us as believers. Our body is a dwelling place for God. It is a dwelling place for God. As we can see from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 from 16 to 17, he tells us, do you know that you are God's temple? And that God's spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God. For God's temple is holy, and that temple is you are. And then he says again on 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 16, for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and move among them, and I will be their God. So this is how God sees our body to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you know, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which are from God? You are not your own, but you are bought with what? A price. And we have discussed about the one that is to come, Jesus Christ. We were bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. So your body is meant to glorify God. Our body is meant to glorify God. So the very body that people in this world discuss about it, we, the faithful, is not even our body. It is the dwelling place of God. And that is for us to glorify through our body. So now the same example that I gave you about St. John, the Baptist, and also our Lord Jesus Christ. When I don't usually know much about Greek, but I got this one, and this is what it says. When Elizabeth heard Mary greetings, the baby in Greek word, it says brephos. The baby that was unborn was also called brephos. Leap it in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. The same word that he used to announce about the birth of St. John, he also used about the actual birth of Jesus Christ, which is Christmas. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign to you. You will find a baby which is breathless. Now this baby is out. The other baby is unborn. Both of them are used as a baby. So in God's eye, it is human beings wrapped in a swaddling clothes mm -hmm. line in a manger. So and the other thing is he also tells us when he was saying about a baby, Elizabeth was hiding for five months. So when we see Elizabeth hid for five months, and then when St. Mary came, it was on the six months. She just, the six months has started. So if we just subtract the six months, which is almost five months, a couple of days, minus five months, it is a matter of days when Elizabeth was pregnant. So it is already a baby since less than a month. Just six minus five would be one, but it is in the beginning of the month when Mary was uh, heard this good news. So we cannot, uh, especially the world hides it, oh, it's only the first uh, week, the first this, the first this, the first tri trimester, all that. But in God, we are planet to come to this earth way even before we come and then this is what happens so we'll continue on whose body is it now specifically we are getting into the center which is the child so if this is the baby and he has every right 
to live because he was created as an image of God with the likeness of God. So he has a right to live and in dignity. Sometimes he is at some point in time fetus and they hide between fetus is part of the mother's body, they say. And uh, this is only a, a way of them. Now she has a free choice to retain or destroy as if like you have an, a material or an equipment where you, if you don't want it, you can just ignore it or throw it. So they say fetus is part of the mother's body and then we will be also looking on that. Whether uh, we really ha uh, anyone has a right to keep or destroy a baby. So when we hear fetus, it's a Latin word and it simply means unborn baby. And as we all know, most of us, I'm sure we have taken biology uh, course and we know how this goes. The mother, we know it has her own DNA, which is the genetic blueprint of all the cells. And they are very unique and specific to the mother. And we have a father also, which is completely different from the mother, but it has its own unique blueprint, which is the DNA. So both the father and the mother have their own specific, unique genetic material and they are coming. And we all know from biology, the new baby, whether we call it zygote, this or that, has also a specific, unique genetic makeup. We know 23 chromosomes comes from here and 23 chromosomes. And in an intricate way, God creates a new one from here with this unique genetic information for that also. So even though this one is dependent, highly dependent on the mother for everything that he needs, it doesn't make him or make her anything less than them. So to say it is my body or somebody's body, it, the science doesn't tell us because this genetic entity is has its own unique organism. Embryo is a genetically unique one. Each cell, they are identical in the, they contain exactly the same genes and is uniquely different from that of either of the parents. We all know that. Therefore, it has its own unique characteristics. Therefore, he has every right like every one of us to live in dignity. And in order to protect that, everything must be done. At times, we talk about stages like germinal stage, embryonic stage, fetal stage, infancy, but it doesn't stop, stop there. After infancy, we say childhood, adolescence, it is a continuation of all the very start, the very beginning, and it is simply a continuation. We are not leaping, we are not jumping from one step to the other, like an animal jumping from a tree to the other one. It is just the very initial when God says this will happen and then it happened and it kept growing. Even we are growing now. Some of us, we still live with our parents. We are dependent. It doesn't make us any less human beings than our parents. We, we just depend on them, but we are human beings created under the image of God. Now, so that's why the church believes that life begins at the moment of conception. And the fetus is regarded as a living being and has every right to both life and dignity. So just like no one has right to kill someone or to for a suicide or anything, this baby has also every right to live and no one has the right to end the baby's life. There is rare condition where 
the life of the mother is uh, in danger and that is very rare even though they uh, in order to justify other things they keep using this but it is very rare and in these rare conditions also the church has a solution now god sees us so precious to him he imparted his life his breath and he gave us everything to rule over and he knows each one of us including the unborn baby but there are many reasons people give that contributed to the decision to abort and we are going to see each one of them out of the people that had uh, that made abortion which i hate to say the word abortion to just interrupt the pregnancy 74 percent of them they just are afraid that their life will change dramatically so that is uh, and then if you go into uh, the depths of it oh this would interfere with my education now think about how precious we are in front of the, the, the eye of God and how precious we are if we really listen to the word of God, how he looks on us, how beautiful, how marvelous, how precious we are. And yet, the inconvenience comes, oh, this is going to interfere with my education. Therefore, 38% of them, they have this contributes to their decision. And some of them, oh, this would interfere with job, employment, and career. Trust me, I do understand that a job is important. And especially here in America, you don't have a job. It is easy to fall into a homelessness or in so many other things. Employment is good, career is good. But is it really justifiable to interrupt to stop a life that God wants it to happen. And that is a blessing according to his word. And it is a gift from him. I just don't need your gift because I have other things to do. No. This is inconvenience. As you can see. So when he sees the reasons that are given to the decision, it is really hard to explain uh, to make a decision if you really understand what human beings are meant for and then 73 percent of them you might see overlap is the percentage if you add them it could be over 100 because some of the reasons they overlap you see uh, out of the 73 percent they say I mean, 40% of them are unmarried. Again, when you are unmarried, it's really tough thinking about raising the child by yourself and what is going to happen. Your future plan that you have already set is going to be messed up. Yes. But is that a reason? To stop pregnancy? No. And some of them, as we have mentioned earlier, students are planning to study. They are either students or planning to study. And this happens as if like uh, somebody put on them and then they ended up aborting or stopping life. They can't afford a baby and child care, 28% unemployed. And some of them can't leave job to take care of the baby. If I'm going to take care of Joby, my job will not be there when I come back. Therefore, it is unbelievable. And then, the next slide, did not want to be a single mother or was having a relationship problems. This, is, this accounts 48%. And not sure about the relationship. And one is like, you are having a baby with someone 
and they are not sure about a relationship and that is a reason for us to for pregnancy oh we don't have a plan to get married therefore i cannot afford to have this baby as if like i cannot afford to to pay my education loan or this or i cannot afford to have this baby it is sad and some of them it is like i am not in a relationship right now i don't know what some people say like you go somewhere in a party or something something happens or oh, i don't even know the person and 11 percent of them therefore i am not even in a relationship therefore i have no choice but throw the child it is it is sad, sad, sad. and some of them are married but we get married for good or bad for everything we are committed for that marriage and yet this marriage is about to break up because now another child or a new child is came so the decisions that you make if you sit down calmly and reason out as to what you are doing in relation to your reasons it doesn't come close And then 23% of them, they are not ready to have a child. And the first one is, I don't want people to know I had sex or got pregnant. Because I will be uh, embarrassed. Yes, it could be embarrassing, but it could also be, you could also have a solution in some ways when you have someone the family is participating in a good way. The embarrassment could be less, but being afraid of being embarrassed or your friends knowing or new friends telling you, is it, can it be a prerequisite to abortion or to stop pregnancy? No. And then don't feel mature enough to raise uh, a child. My God. You were mature enough to, to get pregnant to begin with. So, where is the belief, if especially the believers, where is our faith in him? That the one who, who gives us, he also provides a way. Is that not our uh, father Abraham said when uh, his son Isaac told him like, where do we have uh, something to sacrifice? We have everything, but the one to sacrifice and this is what he told him god will provide and indeed he did provide even though abraham was willing to give his child let alone uh, for for god but god the provider will also find a way as long as you have faith in him and you are committed to the word of him that this child they are about to stop is actually a child an angel of god innocent that is not even messed up with the word yet it is sad and then others husband or partner wants me to have an abortion oh this is what the pressure comes like oh are you pregnant no 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 you have to do something i will leave you and i'm willing to pay and every one of them that say about them, they are willing to pay because the child had to go to stop the pregnancy. But they are not willing to help, to raise. And the end result is a precious child in front of God's eye is about to go. It is really sad. And then there is uh, not very common, but rare, uh, around 13%. You hear that you are pregnant because the cycle is not coming you go there and then you are told you are pregnant and then when they take the blood something is abnormal so you get worried i might end up having a oh and you're sometimes people have an excuse like i don't want him to suffer 
as if like you are thinking about God wanted him to come despite his uh, weakness, despite abnormality. And yet you care enough more than God. You say, I don't want him to suffer. And is that, oh, oh, I don't want myself to suffer too, was a reason. So I'm young. I might have another child coming. All, all this come into point and then the, you decide about the life. Who makes the choice? Is the child consulted or the very God that he wants him to live? Consulted because the word of God, as we have seen it, it would have told us, this is a precious, this is a blessing for you. And it is my gift from me to you. And you would have decided the other way. And that's why the church also, you have no one has the right to stop based on a personal criteria, whether this is a boy or a girl, or he might be disabled, or he might have some issues, or this or that. The church completely inhibits. This is against Orthodox church teaching. And the, the bad part is, where is going to stop? Because now, then you are going to think like, oh, this is old enough. This is all, he just uh, a burden some to some, and he might have Alzheimer or this or that, then the moral issue will be just eroded. So you have to stand. Because you are a believer, because you know God can provide a way when there is no way. So, there is another issue that comes with it also. There is issues. Once this, whoever did stopping the pregnancy, there are other issues that come. Post-abortion stress, just like uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, there are some issues that come and that is going to haunt you forever. One of them would be feeling guilty. And the, the reason is you have your own moral and ethical uh, background. You know, you passed that one for fear that others might think about this. And that comes always like from behind. And then the what we call hyper arousal. And this hyper arousal, uh, sometimes you call it flight, uh, I mean fight or flight, like uh, adrenaline, where something is happening, you just have the, uh, the adrenaline come into you as if like you have to jump, you have to run as if they become permanently alert about something danger is going to come. And as a result, your social interaction with your own family, with the other uh, population uh, communities, you end up becoming reserved because something but might be happening. It just, it comes in your mind. All these reasons that I'm going to, to talk, not all of them come to, to specific person, but a couple of them come here and there, and some of them even more. And then the flashbacks or the intrusions, they just, you re-experience of the traumatic event, the abortion itself. It is a bad, a bad thing. And if this comes in unexpected time, sometimes you just feel bad, especially when it is almost a year from that. You think like, well, wow, I would have a child one year old now. That, that comes also always like the anniversary, because you remember that event, the day that this happened, and it comes, especially when you see children are playing this or that, automatically you go back to where you what he did. So it is not just the sin in front of God, but the life after that will be also messed up. You try to avoid people. Yeah. 
because they they remind you about the past so your relationships the next time are well reserved it's really hard for you to to trust others in situations where you can have a feature a good feature you always this comes and then the anxiety there is anxiety also that comes because of this now you start thinking like may i will i have a child can i be pregnant again uh, coming or uh, doing this i i somehow this might affect me for life so until you start having a new life having a child you always have that question in mind and all this comes on top of the sin that you have to answer in front of the loving god which is also a righteous god he helps every one of us accountable if you don't deal with it so this is what happens that's why the church believers we always say human life must be protected i will share this from proverbs rescue us being led away to death hold back those staggering towards slaughter if you say we knew nothing about this does not he who is the heart perceive it doesn't he know it does he not he who guards your life know it will he not repay each person according to what he has done and as you can see on the second uh, uh, biblical quotation from proverbs also god hates six things and of course even seven of them one of them was hand that sheds innocent blood he said so human life must be protected the unborn human life also must be protected so in some ways if you get involved i am not saying directly but you might have advised a friend that happens to be this or a relative or in some ways if you get involved along this way god takes this thing very serious and you have special this is human being you have to deal with that and he is gracious enough if you, and forgiven enough to give mercy to you as long as you come honest and through the help of your father confessor deal with this you see him this is a merciful god even murderers have been they found grace at his throne and we always sin and we come at his throne and he forgives us so but take this thing very seriously in some ways oh it's not me it's just someone that i gave a couple of ideas or points no you are getting involved and you have to deal with god if you don't you will held accountable for that now then it is not just for you we want you also to participate knowing what god says we want you part of the team to help to share this knowledge that even though there is a legal thing that says this is a woman's choice this is what she can do or she cannot or this or that this is what we know about the word of god and this is what we should study and also share with others as believers because this is a spiritual battle and it has to come through prayer one thing that we don't want to do the church didn't want you to to do is just to argue you don't win with argue but the duty of the church and the duty of the believer is not to argue but to win the heart and minds of people so don't get into endless arguments but try to win that and this starts with prayer 
and then volunteering to help others. Like uh, for a positive influence, if there are uh, institutions, organizations that do that, like helping unmarried pregnant women or poor women, then take your time and volunteer to help in that. So that they will not just survive life, but they will flourish. They will prosper with having a child and also trying to have a system where it can help people that they have, they can actually raise children, even if they happen to be one. So we have to get involved in our communities' works, even specialize in counseling people. Uh, Christian counseling is really helpful in that area. And then when you see people run for uh, positions in the government or in any aspect, see their background, whether they value life, they value uh, families. So you have to be with them and then stand against people that have a different viewpoint of what you believe. So the more each one of us contributes in these things, we can actually win the hearts and minds of people instead of being arrogant like, oh, this, this is or that, or arguing in an English. So this you can do. You can choose one thing and then work on that. Now, may I share my, my uh, could you change it for me to share the slide? I'm about at the end of uh, my, uh, so that I can share uh, the slide that. Yes, you can share right now. So now I, I have to share my uh, personal experience also. 20 years ago, I was a second year student at Georgia Tech for my graduate school PhD program. And then I went with uh, my fiance to get married in my church that I grew and I served since uh, six year old. I got married and we came back to America. And then when he came back to America, this is 2000 Y2K. Some of you probably were not born. So a few months from that, we have a good news that we have our own child. Our first child has about to come. And we are happy about that. And then another call came a few days later. And the physician is telling us to come to home. Yeah, I mean, to this office. And we did, not knowing what is going to happen. And they shared to us, there might be something abnormal. When we do the blood test, we saw something abnormal in your child. And that is something that you don't want to hear, I know. Ah. We got a few minutes to, to, to breathe, to contemplate, and then we ask it. So what is next? And he tells us, oh, we want to do another test that is very specific. And to take amniotic fluid from the very uh, fluid that the child is in. And then we ask, is there anything uh, uh, you can fix when, when you do the test? And no, we just want you to know that uh, the specific of his abnormality and then you have a choice to do, to either terminate or to keep. You don't want to hear that. But again, so you are not changing anything. We don't even need the test because God gave us and we will accept, no matter what. 
So, seven months end up almost eight months. We don't even know what is coming. Except that we, my wife is pregnant and a child is coming and we don't know what the issue is. Every day we are praying. And this is one thing that we are praying. God, we already accepted what you are going to give us. But please, 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 it is okay if you give us, if you give us blind. Even if it's okay, if, if he's deaf, any kind of uh, abnormal deformity or anything. Please keep, please, please keep his mind. Because without that, we cannot even communicate. That was the prayer that we have been praying. And we decided not to share with anyone so that they don't influence our decision to keep our child, including her mother. She's here in America and she's a nurse for 30 something years. We don't want her to affect one way or the other. Oh, you are kid, you are young, you might have another child. You don't know what, what, what kind of advice will be given and or what they will feel even though we are strong on what we are deciding to do. So here comes, 2001, January 15. The labor is about to start. And the mother came from another state, from New Mexico. And all of us are here. We know what is coming, except that we know something is uh, not right. But we kept this with us, and the mother is here. And my wife did everything possible to keep the child, nothing to happen for the child. She even said, I am not taking pain medication at all during the labor until she, she, she can no more uh, bear the, the, the pain. And then after all this, oh, now we don't want the child to be stressed out. We have to do C-section. And one of you can only get in to the room. So I, uh, I said, go ahead, mama scared up, my wife's smart. I will wait here and pray. So the, here they are inside. I'm waiting and I don't even know what's coming. Then, after a certain time, my wife's mom, she comes out with her eyes just swollen because she was crying and crying and crying. I was told she fainted. That what is happening here? So I knew that something really not good is coming. She was mad at me because the physician told her they knew and they decided to keep. And she was, yeah, grandma, uh, mama scared her. You would feel one way or the other, but we have decided. And we don't want you to feel the way you are feeling right now. That's what you should have felt. And probably you would have gone out of your way for your uh, for a child, but that's what we want. And we still believe in him. So the child has to be in ICU and every test that they have done, they don't know what is up to this point, 20 years from now, they don't know what the abnormality is. A lot of five physicians, Emory University Hospital, North Carolina, uh, Stevenson, he's a scientist with, he has his own uh, syndrome named by him. John Hawkins, just a lot of uh, to, to know all what's going on. And they, they already told us he cannot survive. It's very unlikely that this child will grow. In ICU, my wife has to come from home and feed all this, all this. It went all the way, a lot of surgery. The child cannot speak. He's grown until six year old. There was no word that's come six, seven years old. And we knew that he's not going to talk. So we have to teach him language, like uh, hand language, uh, what is called it? Uh, people's deaf that they use their hand for language. So we taught him so that he can communicate with us. But with all these surgeries and all that went, step by step and slowly, slowly, the child started talking. Slight words, certain words coming, and then 
at this point in time, you cannot stop him from talking. I remember. Oh, my goodness. When he was finishing his grade six, this was a special child, but he was so good at, 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 at the education. They said he is, he is even smarter than others, so he cannot be counted as a special child anymore. And then in his grade six, in the whole school, when they receiving graduation certificate, he has to be called for every award. This is a child that is so different from most of them, and yet he is smart enough to be counted for if I don't think anyone got awards certificates during that day. My mom was here. My mother, my wife's mother and father were, we were crying and crying for joy this time. We have cried enough that why this child is suffering God. And yet God is good. And he's trustworthy. You can see he's a happy child. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he finished his middle school too. When he gives a hug in our church, like they know that Yenatan's hug is something special, that he gives you 110%. Yeah. Slowly, he was growing. And we have witnessed that God is, in fact, he could come. He's trustworthy. As long as we keep, I, well, there are many times that we, fa I, 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 we failed as parents or this or that. But the very moment that we trusted him, after all these ups and downs, this is the child that we, we have. He didn't stop there. He finished his high school. And now he is a second year student. 3.8 average. God is good and he is trustworthy. That's why just not only the word of God telling us how precious they are. Look how, how he has actually a plan when they told us you can stop it. Right, God has a plan for every one of them. And I, I just expect you to, to trust him, especially in the most important ones. And he will teach you, he will humble you, but he will also bless you. That's why I'm going to finish with two words. This is for the people of God, he told them, this is the day I call the heavens and the earth as a witness against you. That I have set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Now, choose life. So that you and your children may live. And Jesus himself, this is what they asked him. They were saying good things about Jesus or they were praising him. And then they are not happy about that. They told him, have you any idea what these children are doing? And Jesus said, yes, most assuredly. He said, yes, definitely. Have you not seen in the writings? from the lips of children and babies as the breast. Babies as the breast, you have made your praise complete. God's praise is complete is with the babies as the breast. So our praise will be complete with the very child that God gave us. God will give you and don't for a moment choose any other one. May God bless you all. I am done here. Thank you so much, Father. I'm, I'm honestly speechless. I think it's beautiful and um, like all happiness and joy for your family. Um, we are going to start with questions right now. Um, so I have a few that have come in. I'm going to start with those. And then everyone, um, please send your questions if you have any um, to myself or Lydia Mansoor. You can find her in the chat. Those are the questions that we will be reading from. Um, Father, you can, yeah, okay. Um, so first question is, 
uh, you've actually covered some of these. So I'm gonna go through and make sure we get ones that aren't covered. Okay, um, first question. Um, so from the examples that you gave from the Bible, um, no Christian can argue that an unborn baby is a human being in God's image from the very first day of conception. From a scientific point of view, once the zygote begins to split into multiple cells and grow, it is considered a life being. How can people who are non-Christian still consider it a non-human? So if scientifically, if I understand this question correctly, if scientifically it is life once the zygote starts splitting into multiple cells, how can people still claim that it is not a human or not life until much later? Um, and how does this play into so different things? So when a person, if a person were to kill a pregnant woman and he's charged with double murder, um, but again, killing the baby itself is not seen as murder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Satros, is that, yes, they do that. And it is under the, cons uh, uh, under the understanding that the fetus is within, inside the mother. But even inside the, uh, the one thing that they say is, it is her privacy. This is inside her. The only, it's just the location that it is inside, not outside. And because it's inside here, she can do whatever she wants. That's, that's the argument that they have. But it definitely, science tells us this is a specific entity. It is simply dependent on the mother, which is also the baby that is born is also dependent on the mother for everything, including the, the milk or, or feeding the child, cleaning. All those things, the child, a one month or a year child doesn't do anything, just like the child that is inside. The child that's inside is fed by the mother and the other one is fed by the mother, except that now they can see that there is a body that is outside of the, uh, of the mother. But we know uh, when, when, uh, when my mother or uh, my wife was pregnant, we could see like, oh my goodness, his foot is coming this way. Sometimes we see it in, 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 in the, just uh, while he's moving, he can actually touch or you could hear a movement. Oh my goodness, uh, he's, not, he's asleep now. This is the point where we talk about our birthday child when we had our own child. Oh, he's great now, this or that. So it is sad that they uh, formed an argument saying that this child is, she can do whatever she wants, when in fact it is not true that this is a specific entity. It is a continuous process. I, as I said earlier, it starts with zygote, but they say pre-embryo, embryo, it is not like he was zygote. At some point in time, he becomes embryo. He becomes this, he doesn't jump or it's just a continuous process. As if like a teenager, uh, 12 year old and 364 uh, days, with 164 days, is not a teenager by definition. And then once one day he passes, he becomes 13. We call him a teenager. Does, it, does he live to something? Except that this is a continuous process. And the sad part is once they set it at a matter of private uh, thing, now they are letting uh, people just do what, whatever they want to do. And, when they don't have a, a spiritual background, when they don't have what it really means to have a human being, then you see all these things happen. So it is sad, I, I, I don't know. And that's how I feel. Okay, next question. I'm going a little bit out of order. I'm going to add to this one because I also had a similar question. Um, one of my close Orthodox friends is a strong pro-choice supporter. We get into many arguments, but as stated earlier, it's all to no avail. It's hard to lead by example in such cases if it doesn't affect you um, or if you are a guy. 
How do you approach a fellow Orthodox Christian who insists that being pro-life is political and the church shouldn't be political? And I would add on to that, um, how do you approach it if you're a man? Because oftentimes the argument is that this is a woman's issue and that men shouldn't speak on it. So two questions. How do you approach someone who says that it's political and the church shouldn't be political? And then how do you approach it if someone says only women have a right to discuss abortion? Yeah. yeah. This is what happens. Most of the time when, when, uh, when we are discussing about, about abortion or uh, stopping the pregnancy, with all likelihood, the woman is by herself. The man is, is this is not a good family, a husband and wife. One of them is already uh, knows that. So it becomes a, an option for a single parent. And now all we see is the problem that creates for this single mother just to raise by herself. And that's where, where uh, the problem comes, even though the choice, she has a choice. Every one of us, we have a choice. You have a choice prior to conception, not after the conception. You have a choice. You have the right to, to marry or not, to, not to, to get married. That option is there. Even she has a degree of freedom to choose to become pregnant or not, right? You you have it, you have actually that choice, that freedom too, even though most of the time is not really dependable, but you have certain freedom before the conception. Once a child comes, now you have a, a human being that he cannot defend himself, that someone has to stand up for him or someone has to, to really care about him the way God sees the child. So the freedom of choice is prior to conception, not after. Now, the child has also every right to live, to enjoy life, just like my son. You could see how, how smiling, oh, if you have seen his hug, it's a, it is a completely different thing. So that uh, argument is, you have a living entity and that living entity has a right to live. So the choice is before, not after. Once you have conception, but again also, the reason is instead of creating an atmosphere where a single mom could raise a child that she knows that she has our back, that she is supported by the community, by the government, that she can actually survive, by the people around here, we don't give that. Therefore, the easy way out for us is just simply to give her a choice to stop it. And that's where we fall apart. We don't give an option for adoption or even to, to create an atmosphere where she can actually work and she can still raise the child by working, having a babysitter. All those things matter for, for a, a woman that has her own child. So this is where we fall. We don't support the for simply saying, no, 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 she has to raise him. Then it is a burden for her. And we, when you don't have a really good spiritual background, it is easy to fall. And nowadays, anyway, if everybody is doing, it must be okay. That is the mindset of uh, the America anyway. It is not, uh, uh, you don't, we don't have a red line, wh which one is right, which is not. Instead, if everyone is doing, it must be okay. Just go with the heart, with the, with the whole people. So this is where uh, we fall apart. Again, even with your friend, don't, the argument doesn't bode well. It, it ended up, if anything, it ended up creating an atmosphere of not communicating with each other. Instead, the goal of us as Christians is to win their hearts, to win their minds by sometimes going to a place where uh, children that they don't have mother and father and yet these are beautiful children and they can be happy they really have a life of their own even 
disabled, deformed. When you go to children's hospitals, you see a lot of people, and yet the happiest ones, the ones that were not even just messed up with these worlds, it's just they are as innocent as you could see. When you show them, when you go with them to help uh, volunteer and then ask your friends to volunteer on these areas, then all of a sudden they have the feeling that this is what, in fact, is a serious thing. And then once they think about it, he can win, just not the family, but the child that is about to come. And now we have one more in our camp and one loss on the other side's camp. So that's what we are supposed to one on one. We know we, are, we have so many to reach, but you don't start, uh, Rome is not built by in one day, they say. So just work one at a time and it will, it will uh, board well because God, that's what he wants and he will equip us also with the, uh, the knowledge and wisdom how to deal with them when we pray. Okay, the next question is, um, people justify, as you mentioned in your presentation, often justify abortions talking about the suffering and poverty or the hard life that the baby would be born into. Do you think this is a tiny step away from legalizing euthanasia or in or a tiny step away from us deciding when someone's life is too miserable to live. Yeah, 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 it is, it is. Again, this, they say beauty is on, on the eye of beholder, right? Beauty is on the eye of beholder is, on what? I are you on what lens are you watching this? This one. If we look at the way God sees it, God doesn't see anything. He just have a plan for him, for my son, for any other other one. And that plan is always said, the plan that I have of you is a good plan, a plan for you. He cares. So when you see it by a really deformed uh, lens as human beings, that's what we have. Unless we see it the way the creator, the one who gave the breath of life, sees it, then it is nothing more, nothing less than the other one. And he has every life to live because that is God let him come to this earth and God knows how this person is going to go. So it is not our choice. We, the way we see things is simply we are not seen from the one that created life. Instead, we are seeing it from the one that is being inconvenient. Uh, the life will be hard. Oh, I will be ashamed to have this because I am not. All these are just the reasons that doesn't board well and they don't have any water to hold. So let's see it from God's point of view, and we are equal in front of him. The small, the adult, the elderly, the child that was not, the John that is not born yet, but he told him, I chose you to be this. And the, the child that came later, it is the same John that was announced, and that is the same John who sacrificed his life for his own faith. Therefore, we have to see it on really a good perspective in God's way, because he is the creator of life. We are not. We are just part of his grand scheme. So this is how we should see it. And every, any other angle that we see, it will, will, it will end up uh, a wrong end point. Thank you, Father. The next question is, um, so oftentimes um, an alternative that people give to abortion is adoption mm -hmm. and to have the child and to put the child up for adoption. Um, but from my own personal experience, adoption isn't as highly uh, encouraged in the church, um, whether it is to adopt or to put a child up for adoption. What are your thoughts on that and how do we, what can we do? Okay. This is a good question. Yeah, adoption. First of all, when we adopt, adoption is a good thing, first of all. It is really good. It is a noble thing that people actually 
uh, get out of themselves and then they are willing, they are loving enough to have a child and raise them. And most of the time, this happens to a child who has no parents, who has no father or mother. Some of them are just orphans. They don't have mother and father. So for these ones, this is a really a good, a good drink, life-giving uh, drink. So the church actually welcomes this. Are we not adopted? All of us as Christians, we are adopted to the sonship of God through the son who is Jesus Christ. Is that not, this is what the, uh, in John, he came to his own. His own didn't accept him, but to those who accepted him and believed him, he gave them to become children of God. In order for us to be children of God, we have to be adopted to the sonship of the father through Jesus Christ. So the word adoption is actually we are all adopted children of God through our loving father, first of all. And adoption also, in the Bible, we could see adoption in so many beautiful ones. Uh, let's see, Moses, Moses is adopted child. The Pharaoh, his daughter, basically, she went there and then the child, here is the child that was crying over there and then she saw him, she cried too, and she took him. And we know what happened about Moses. He led the people of God to the promised land. And this is an adopted child. And we have uh, another one too. Hold on. Mardukai, Mardukai, uh, Mardukai and uh, Esther. Esther was adopted uh, by Mardukai when her mom and dad died. Even though he's part of her family, he adopted her and we know the end result is between Mardukai and her, she saved the people of God. This is an adult, an adult child. We have uh, actually beautiful stories in the Bible. And we are him, we, uh, I think it is uh, in uh, Galatians also. He says, okay, hold on. Let me have the uh, Galatians chapter four. Let me see. Oh, I have it here. Okay, this is what it says. But when the fullness of the time had come, this is when the time has come where God has to show, uh, when Jesus has to, to have our own flesh. God sent for his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So the adoption as sons comes through the one that has our own flesh through our uh, Saint Mary. And because you are sons, God has sent for the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, the Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. So our adoption to sonship came through Jesus Christ. And if you are a son, then you are also a heir of God's through Christ Jesus. This is Galatians chapter four, uh, from four to seven. So adoption is, it is really a good thing. Yes, the church, if everything is an ideal thing, we want a child to be raised by the mom and the dad. If that is not happening because the father is not there, the mom is dead or, or this or that, it is a noble thing to do. We just didn't want a single parent to raise him because every the father has its own role, his own role, the mother has her own role. The child has to get both because the husband is the head of the house. So he gets something from the father that he cannot get from a, a single man, or he gets something special from the mother that he cannot get as a single father. So the church prefers that we have a child from both parents, but for any reason, if these parents are not that, adoption is a good thing and a noble thing. It is something that we, except that we don't want to leave it to oh, a one person where uh, he's not raised the way the church wants. So this is uh, how I see it. The adoption is, this is something that we should work on. If we are not doing enough, 
This is something that a noble thing. When we are telling someone, please keep this child, then we have to have other mechanisms and options also that is not in opposition to the word of God. So that's how I see it. Thank you, Father. So we only have two questions left. Um, everyone, we hope that you stick around. We know that we're a little bit past 8.30. Um, and two questions left. One is, if you are an Orthodox healthcare provider, what is your role when approached with abortion? Yeah, uh, I, 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 uh, luckily uh, for me, I, I, I am a critical care pharmacist. I, I always see people dying, but not on, 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 on the, on the when the child is born. In fact, it is when it is emergency, cord blues, like when you have. Uh, someone is dying because the heart is not working or not breathing. I am always part of the team uh, in the hospital that I am working. I am always there when uh, to save uh, uh, as a clinical pharmacist with all the emergent medications that that the patient should get at that very moment to keep him. So I am not in a position, but an unorthodox believer, there are things that you don't cross. The one that we are talking, for example. There are a lot of Christian counselors, doctors also, uh, uh, psychiatrists uh, uh, that in my case, I do know some, uh, if there are uh, some issues that families have, I do send them to Christian uh, counselors or this or that. So as an orthodox, uh, orthodox believer, there are certain things that you don't cross. And one of them would be this, the ones that we are speaking, the, the ones that we are talking. The, that's a red line because this is not your own. Yes, if they decide to do the family, they have a lot of other options, a lot of doctors that they are willing to, to get the money anyway. So we counsel them that this is a noble thing that they have, they can actually survive and given them options that they, they might change their mind that they want to keep the child. So uh, you, you send them to Christian counselors before they actually decide for good. And most of them, they change, especially when they see this child is uh, under, uh, uh, like, uh, what is called, it? not ex uh, kind of x ray, where you see the child actually moving, the heart is this or that. Most of the time, oh my goodness, how can I do this? And they change. So you really have to know Christian counselors in different areas, psychiatrists, Christians, because the other option is. Just they will tell you, take this medicine, do this, do that. And there are a lot of them. So an alternative, uh, we have to create an alternative way to counter that. Thank you. And last question is, um, is there an instance when extensive testing or um, prenatal care is permitted by the church? For example, from a mother's blood test, a developing fetus can be diagnosed with spina bifida. When it's discovered, the mother can opt to get prenatal surgery. Surgery is usually performed around the 26th week of pregnancy where the mother's uterus is opened up and the surgery is done, but it risks premature birth. When you have these options, do you take them or do you trust in God and have the child with whatever um, illnesses or abilities that it comes with? Yeah. Let's, let's say this. First of all, it really uh, requires faith. Uh, through faith, it comes out in, 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 in situations like this. So you see sometimes uh, con con congenital disease, physical anomaly, or uh, some mental defect, or this or that. But the question is, let's say you don't, you don't do the test. Uh, assume that you have uh, no knowledge beforehand. There was no test. And then this is, you are a husband and wife and you have a child and this child was, uh, came. Is there, do you think, is there any parent, one the child came that they wanted him to die? They don't, right? So having, earlier knowledge of something doesn't make it right or not. 
still, I know it is a tough thing that you are asking, but still, earlier knowledge doesn't negate the fact that this child that was born or did was not born still is a child. So the thesis are there. We are okay as believers. If if they change, that's what we did. They are not going to change anything about my my mind. And then there, there was no reason even to, to go about that. So just gave, at that time, God gave us the strength to believe him. And it happened. And uh, we can see. So the point is, one human being, freedom, or they have every right to do this, it should not be on denying another child of, of living or, or existing. Yes, I said earlier, you have a right to choose no, before the conception. And it should not be at the expense of denying another life. That is, that is the thing that we need to think about Christians, but it depends on level of uh, trusting God. So it's, it's a tough question to answer, uh, really. I, yeah, I will. Doing that again to me, I, I will definitely trust him again. Now that he actually, he showed me that he is trustworthy by simply believing in him and he did this wondrous thing to me, I will do it again. I don't think uh, uh, with an eye of a blink, whatever might come, I don't even do it. So it depends on uh, where you are in regard to how you're, you're trusting God. But I want you to choose life still. When God wants to, to, to end, this is what I, I know. I used to tell my kids, uh, uh, most of you probably seen, uh, Bill Cosby shows, uh, uh, I love some of the episodes of Bill Cosby. One of them was his son, uh, uh, he's uh, like, Dad, I am not like you. I always, uh, uh, I have to be myself or this or that. And then he tells, he is under 18 and he's under him. And this is what he told him. I brought, I always laugh with my kids. I brought you to this world. I can't take you out from this world. So there is one who brought us to this world. And definitely it is not you, me, or anyone. And that is the only one who can bring, take us from this world. And when we mess up with that, we are in trouble. So, yeah, that's how the way God wants it. It could be tough. It could be a lot of ups and downs, but that's what Christianity is all about. You carry your own cross. And God doesn't give us a cross that we cannot carry. He says that uh, God doesn't test you with something that you are not capable of carrying it. So that's that's the message that I want you to leave. Thank you so much, Father. Um, those are all the questions that we had. Um, we appreciate you taking the time for sharing with us um, your, your wisdom on this and then also your story. Um, we, I speak for everyone, that was amazing. Um, for everyone who's still on, really quickly, um, we thank everyone who showed up. We still have Canadians who are with us, so we're very happy with that. We had a few priests with us, Father Ben, Father Yeprem, Father Manchila, we thank you so much for your presence. Um, the next webinar will be in on December 15th by Father Samuel Varghese. The topic is Sexuality and Society, Defining Love in Modern Times. Registration will be coming out shortly, so please look out for that and tell your groups and your friends. Um, other than that, there's nothing left to close off but to pray. Abuna Ben, can you lead us in closing prayer, please? Uh, sure, I'll be happy to. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. The Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much, O Lord, because we are, each and every one of us are fearfully and wonderfully made. Father, I thank you because you chose to create us when we were not. Father, it is 
definitely a much better thing to experience life, even if it has problems or sufferings or sickness or disease, um, because it is a stepping stone to spending eternity with you, Lord. Um, Father, um, I apologize to you on behalf of all of humanity that we often choose what is convenient instead of what is right to do what is abhorring to you and what saddens your heart instead of what honors you and delights your heart. And I ask you to please forgive us, Lord, and to grant us a soft, attentive heart to your calling and, and the tugging of our heart that we may respond to it and to respond to it immediately without delay. Father, thank you so much for my father's the priest and the wonderful enlightening talks and all the effort that they've put in it, O Lord, and the marks that they've left on our hearts with their talks. I pray that we go away from this, remembering it, applying it, speaking out loud about it, and talking to people around all the potential alternatives to open their eyes to the lies of the world that tell them there's no other option, just get rid of this baby. Help us, O Lord, to be churches that are full of cultures that are accepting and not judgmental, so that if it happens uh, at any of our churches, O Lord, that we may support the couple or the mom to be and to be there for her and to assure her that we can all uh, join her in, in, in raising this child, O Lord, so that we may increase the chances of her keeping it. Help us, O Lord, to do always whatever it is that brings you joy and glory and honor, and that is according to your will. We ask you to please hear us through the intercession of St. Mary and all you saints and martyrs who please you from the beginning of the mighty power for your love-giving cross. As we all pray to you, thankfully saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us as they are daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for them is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now the love of God, the Father, grace is only begotten Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, the communion, the gift of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Go in peace. Peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you so much, Shabuna. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you, Father Asma. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sephra. Good night.